Hey guys, Abel Vadia here on the Legally Exhausted podcast. We're here at the FJA event, uh, Masters of Justice in West Palm Beach. I got an amazing attorney with me, uh, Jed Kurzban. That's right, Jed yeah. Kurzban. Jed Kurzban, and um, that is of what descent? Romanian. Romanian, that's really cool. That's really yes. cool. You don't Not see a lot that of every Romanians. day. Yeah. I know. Cool. So um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where'd you grow up? Where did you, you know, go to school and, and how did you become a lawyer? Okay. Well, I'm from Miami. I'm a true Miami boy. 305, Born baby. And raised, 305. It's my city. So, I mean, I was, I grew up in Miami in the eighties Okay. when things were real and it was a lot of fun and it was crazy and it tempered a lot of how you work with the city. Mm -hmm. um, went to you know, high school, everything through Miami, um, played sports. So I went to the University of Alabama to try to walk onto the football team and they did not need a five foot six excited fullback linebacker. Apparently that was not what they were looking for there. <laughs> then I came back to- But you UN shot your Law. shot. I met you with Coach off. Curry and I yeah. said, I'm, I'm here, you need me. And there you he go. said, you're adorable little fella and you should try <laughs> intramural sports. I said, I play bigger than I look. He said, you know, that's great. Uh, <laughs> intramurals for you. And then I awesome. came back home to UM Law because I knew I wanted to be back in Miami because it's Magic City. Yeah. And I've been practicing law. I graduated law school in 90, December of 95. I took the bar February of 96. My first trial was June of 96. And I've been wow. trying cases ever since. So I had a trial before I could even get sworn in with the sworn in class. So I had to go to a judge that did my lit skills class. Oh. And uh, told me, you're gonna get them, go get them, you're gonna be great one day. And so I went back to that judge, said, judge, I have a trial next week. And is there any chance you could swear me in? I passed the bar and he stopped the whole open court back then. Everyone used to go to open court. There'd be 30 lawyers in court. Mm. He said, this is Jed Kurzban, who's gonna be a lawyer. Everyone take notice, and he swore me in right there in open court. Wow. And then the next week I was in trial. What kind of trial was that? It was my first trial. It was a case against the Florida Marine Patrol for a, a Cuban immigrant fisherman who was, he was stealing lobsters from traps, which is an issue. And the oh, Florida wow. Marine Patrol, to get him, swamped his boat, which is he drove his boat fast, as fast as he could, right up to this little fisherman skiff, oh. flipped the boat over with the wake. Oh, My client flipped out of the boat, and then the boat circled back around, and the propeller slices quadricep muscle, so he wasn't able to walk ever again. He had oh. this terrible limp. Wow. And we went to the jury and said, you know, do you lose your leg because you stole lobsters? Wow. Yes, he was wrong. Yes, he stole lobsters. He shouldn't have done it. But you don't lose your leg because of that, because this Yahoo cowboy wannabe Florida Marine Patrol officer was gonna teach him a lesson. That's not his job. Wow. And so the jury gave us a very nice award back then for Key West. It was written in the newspapers. And nice. I realized this is what I wanted to do. I'm gonna help people. That's and incredible. So I've been helping people ever since. Man, that's really cool. Uh, you just reminded me of a, that's a sad story, but a funny story. I went lobster diving with my, with my buddy and uh, it was murky. And yeah. uh, you can't always see under the water and we get up and you always want to check them for eggs because if they right. have eggs, you've got to put them back down, right? Um, so that they can, you know, have babies and the next generation of, of lobsters, course. you can kill them. So- um, <laughs> tickle stick in your net. Yeah, yeah. And so we go down there, it comes up and uh, uh, the Marine Patrol comes over and the guy was definitely his first day on the job. It was, it was, um, I forget what it's called, it's like preseason. So yeah. it's like the first, yeah, mini season. mini season. So the guy comes up to our boat and he goes here, he backs it up, he goes forward. He didn't know how to dock up next to another boat. And my buddy's a smart ass, he goes, hey, let me pull it up. You stay there, I'll pull it up. And the guy goes like, no, no, no. And, uh, and then he goes, he goes, we're clean, man. We just got two lobsters, everything's clean. The guy sees all the eggs, he gives him a ticket. And, uh, and I was like, you should have you shut up about, let me dock it up for you. And so, mm -hmm. That's an unfortunate case. That's really terrible. So you had a, a jury award, a jury verdict, and that was like right after you got sworn in. That's incredible. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah, so it was really great. And that client actually sent me probably seven, eight clients in my career because wow. he loved what we did for him. And yeah. it made me realize I have a very small law firm in that I never carry more than eight to 10 cases total. Mm -hmm. and we get to know our clients and we love our clients and they love us and mm -hmm. 
our clients have sent us clients my whole career. That's how we've really made my firm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And so uh, you went to U UM school. Your office is located in? Coral Gables. Coral Gables. Okay, nice. I like uh, Miracle Mile down there. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's fun. It's Food a beautiful great. place. Yeah, it is a nice place. Um, I, I, I never pay for parking. I always park on the street. I don't pay for parking. I roll the dice. You I have a partner that once. does that and he gets hit every once in a while the yeah. ticket and he tries to get me, the firm, to pay for the ticket oh, for the partner. God. Like, you roll the dice, yeah, buddy. Yeah, you roll the dice, you play the game, yeah. So um, awesome. So let's talk a little bit about you and the cases that you do like to handle. Um, sure. You handle all types of injury cases. So because I have a, a small caseload, which I purposely keep small, we handle catastrophic injury cases. Okay. I've done, we just finished a rollover case. Um, we've done car accident, product liability. I've done some hostile work environment. I did a sexual discrimination case. But the bulk of what I do is medical malpractice. And within that bulk of medical malpractice, I've developed a niche in failing to diagnose kidney disease cases, which okay. I've tried all over the country. We've been in nine states. Um, we get local counsel. Sometimes a case comes from the client. Sometimes it comes from local counsel. Okay. And we work with them to get justice for our clients that are in kidney failure, which is really just a horrible life that if you have to live through that. Is that dialysis? Is that what typically So generally happens? most of our clients are either on dialysis or on a transplant list waiting for a transplant. Okay. And they ask us, you know, I've been going to the doctor for years. How could all of a sudden I need a new kidney? Why am I on dialysis? Mm -hmm. And my team and I will go back, we'll get all the records, we'll look back, we'll see if, because kidney disease is very obvious by labs. So we'll look at all the labs and we'll see lab results and we can backdate when kidney disease was occurring and what medications and treatment should have been given that were available okay. that would have prevented kidney disease from progressing to end stage renal disease, which is when you need dialysis and kidney transplant. Okay, so um, some of these failure to diagnose kidney disease cases, um, you handle them all over the country if, if they're warranted for, for you, for what you need. Correct, so I had, a, I had a couple in Florida, which as a Florida attorney, in my mind, they were you know medical malpractice cases. Mm -hmm. And then I got a call about 20 years ago from a lawyer in Hawaii that said, I have a client, he's in kidney failure, he saw your results on the webpage. I don't do medical malpractice, would you talk to my client and help me with this case? And after investigating the case, it was a really good case. They should have prevented his kidney failure. Wow. So I ended up going to Hawaii, trying the case. We got a six and a half million dollar verdict, which was the biggest verdict in Honolulu at the time. Wow. And um, that led to a case in South Carolina. And then I had to think about it and thought, why don't I travel the country if people need help and no one mm -hmm. can help them? And I have the information I've made. A lot of what makes me, me is I've made contacts with certain doctors over the years mm -hmm. and Experts that know Experts kidney failure. That are, you know, the head of Harvard, the head of Yale. Okay. And, you know, the head of UCLA, pathology. These are the best of the best in the country. And they love working with me because I have a smaller caseload and I can give attention to people and things. And and so they love working with me. And so anytime I got a case, I have their cell phones. I call them up and we talk about it. And if they're on board, then we start to move forward on the case. Cool. I need you to be 100% honest with me because you're on the podcast. All I, right. How many times did you say book them Dano in the Honolulu case? Uh, we did not. <laughs> no? We were very okay. careful because we were clearly not. Outsiders. Um, you guys we were, were outsiders. Yeah. We were mainlanders. Okay. And as mainlanders, we had a real uphill battle with the judge who really didn't want us there. Wow. Did you and, come in like uh, in federal court, they say pro hoc vice. Correct. Is that how you came in? So we came in pro hoc vice with okay. this large commercial firm in Hawaii. Okay. That I've since then taken the bar and I've partnered with them. Oh, wow. My law firm in Honolulu now. So I have okay. an office in Honolulu. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, no, it's not a pro hoc vice. They want to go. Uh, <laughs> they want to go. They want to. <laughs> they're hoping I, for some cases from this podcast. They're like, please get us a Honolulu case. Well, I'll be honest. My, yeah. my, Associate Lauren, she's been with me for almost eight years now. She started as a law clerk. She was so brilliant, I had to hire her. She's been working with me since. And she recently just finished a trial in North Dakota with me. So okay. I feel like I owe her a Hawaii trial now because okay. she suffered through a very <laughs> cold North Dakota trial 
in spring when it snowed like 12 feet on negative the, six April, or something like it what? was crazy we have pictures yeah. that are ridiculous <laughs> so it was amazing but that was a kidney case also in north dakota for a trucker that needed help we helped them wow uh, the defense firms, like most defense firms, are so despicable and disgusting. They took us to the Supreme Court of North Dakota, wow. where we had to argue in front of the Supreme Court of North Dakota. They upheld our verdict, thankfully, and we were able to get a very good result for our client, who is nice. very happy and has a beautiful family. And if we can keep them around a little bit longer, we hope to do that. And so this this money, part of it is to take care of past medical expenses, future medical expenses and then just correct i'm assuming if you got to be on dialysis and, and other things like this you can't work a full-time job can't work yeah you can't work any job okay it just wipes you out completely so they okay. end up going into huge debt they end up mm. losing you know their trucks and their houses being foreclosed and right it's really horrible the situation well, and if he's able a to trucker what's he gonna do he's back right yeah it's not like okay so we're able like to pay back job. a lot of those bills and get their lives on track for a bit and wow Help them out. Help and then the obviously family. they think about their family and their children and yeah. and what they could do as a legacy to leave for their children if they're not yeah. gonna live a normal life expectancy because most kidney failure patients don't live a normal life expectancy. Right. And and just the you know, the future of the family without the main caretaker or of a course. caretaker, uh, it means a lot to the family, I'm sure. So okay, very cool. Um so you do these failure to diagnose kidney disease cases, you do other med mal cases. Uh, can you tell me um, like what, I mean, I'm just, I'm curious for my own sake, like what is a failure to diagnose kidney disease? Like what's the most common failure? Is it the it not reviewing the blood so, work? So correct, a hundred percent. So generally we sue the GP or a pediatrician because we've had several children with kidney Ooh, disease. That's sad. Uh, or an OBGYN, which a lot of time is considered a primary doctor for a woman. Okay. They'll just use an OB. Um, okay. And they just, they don't follow up the labs. And the labs show clear kidney disease progressing. So okay. a lot of times they might say, you know, you get into an age now where you might go and the doctor say, oh, you were probably dehydrated that day. Your labs were not perfect. Mm. All right, well, you do it again and now it's worse. You do it again, now it's worse. You do it again, now it's worse. I mean, you got four terrible labs. Mm. It's no longer dehydration. They're getting worse. You need to start to do things. There's a lot of medicines to help kidney disease. One of the most common signs of kidney disease is high blood pressure. Okay. So a lot of times these primary doctors will treat the high blood pressure and not recognize the kidney disease portion of it. Okay. And so... Um there's, there's medicine out there to help slow or prevent further kidney disease or both? Both. So a okay. lot of kidney disease, like kind of like cancer, goes through stages. You don't feel sick with kidney disease. There's no obvious physical sign of kidney disease. Okay. So you don't know you have it. It's all in the labs. But you're stage one, two, three, four. Okay. So if you're in stage two or three, which is your kidneys are not doing great, but the medicines can help keep you there 30, 40, 50 years. Oh, wow. You never get worse than that. Okay. Once you lose kidney function, you can never regain it. It's okay. sort of like Alzheimer's that way. You can't regrow those brain cells. You can't regrow those kidney nephrons. Nephrons are what filter you for your kidneys. Okay. Once they die, they're dead. You can never get them back, but okay. you can stop more from dying if you treat them correctly. Okay. Wow. Okay. So you handle these cases nationwide. What other types of cases do you like to handle? Like what's another area? Well, we do a handle? lot of a lot of med mal, shoulder dystocia and herb palsy, which is birth related injuries of okay. babies that aren't being delivered correctly. Um, so, you know, we've done a few of those locally. I've done a few with what's called the Federal Tort Claim Act, where you sue a government hospital, because a lot of times servicemen and women are treated at a federal medical army hospital. And those army hospitals are poorly funded. They have mm -hmm. poor doctors, poor treatment there. And so they cause a lot of problems. But when you sue the government hospital, you really sue the US government. So it's an entirely different realm or arena called a Federal Tort Claim Act. Okay. So we've done several Federal Tort Claim Act cases to help these birth injuries of these servicemen and women also of civilians, you know, locally. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we're, we've done a lot of those and a lot of my med mal is also related around failing to diagnose cancer on time and okay. treating cancer timely. 
So, gotcha. You know, currently we have one with a, a tumor in the face, a Wharton tumor in the face that was never treated. And so, you know, mm. we fight these cases, and there's always ridiculous defenses that these moron defense lawyers make up on behalf of these scumbag insurance companies that'll yeah. pay tens of millions of dollars to fight cases. Right. For what reason I've never figured out. You know, half yeah. the time I fight these cases, there's a policy of 250. Mm -hmm. Tender your policy. No. Okay. So now they spend $2 million fighting me. They lose $4 million to a verdict. Mm -hmm. They lose another million dollars in costs and fees. And they're like, oh, it's so bad. These lawyers, what are you talking about? You had a 250 yeah. policy, you'd clear negligence, yeah. pay your policy. Right. But they don't. They'd rather, you know, the whole little world of defense insurance work where these insurance yeah. companies pay these insurance firms endless amounts of money to fight over it's ridiculous so nonsensical things i saw i saw there was a case with united auto insurance which is like to me the bottom of the barrel insurance they sell it in miami mostly and uh, they sued for malpractice their defense attorney that i'm sure they encouraged to keep litigating defending delaying the case they sued the defense firm for malpractice saying we went to trial and we got this huge 10 million dollar judgment and it was a 100k policy why didn't you advise us properly? And I'm thinking, what? And it's it's funny because the insurance company, the auto insurance company was suing the defense firm who probably had a big uh, malpractice policy. So they're suing them, trying to squeeze them for money to help offset the, right. the verdict that they got that probably, like I know United Auto very well. They do $500 offers, $1,000 offers on any car accident case. Um, regularly right and uh they defend you know i do a lot of pip suits as well and they defend those cases till the bitter end i rack up huge fees we're about to go to trial on the case and then they go uh we'll give you ten thousand dollars and i'm like i worked on this case for four years you want me to take ten thousand dollars like you could have settled this three years ago you know three years ago a year in and realized that it was a bad case for you guys i think it's like a numbers game for them there's some bean counters or Maybe their cousin owns the defense firm. I haven't figured it out yet. I'm, I'm working well, on that. Well, part of the secret is what they do is they create reserves. Okay. So they'll say, we have these nine cases. We think the worst we're going to lose is a million dollars. So we're going to take this million dollars and put it in reserve. And then that reserve million dollars earns a ton of interest while they're fighting these cases. Mm -hmm. And then they go back to the legislator and say, you know, oh, we're in trouble. We need help. And they get tons of money from the government to help them. Yeah. And then whatever cases they finalize and sue and serve and work, then they are able to start to say, okay, we're done. You know, we lost these two cases, but we won these two cases. We settled this case. So we paid mm -hmm. out, you know, this money. Let's take that million dollar reserve, which is now a million eight because of interest. And now they're like, well, you know, we've made $800,000 on the million we knew we should have paid in the beginning, mm -hmm. but we wanted our interest payment and that helped us move the money around. It also took the money off our books for taxes, for benefits. Yeah. And so that's the game that they play with these reserves. Yeah, it sounds like and a it ought to be scheme. investigated. It really is a Ponzi yeah. scheme, but a lot of that reserve money goes to elect these low life yeah. legislators that make these laws to help them. Yeah, and uh, you know, just talking about Ponzi schemes, um, it's the thing I hate about insurance, which you know, we do need insurance for driving a car, right? Right. I get it. But it's government mandated that you have insurance. So it's a guaranteed customer. And then on top of that, they treat the customers like shit when there is a claim. They do. It just doesn't make sense to me. And then if they ever have bad enough problems, they can just close shop and bail out, yep. start a new name. They just had uh, like five carriers did that in the homeowner's right. context recently. Windhaven Auto Insurance Wind went Haven. out of business a few years ago. And they're back in business under Wind a new Haven? name. Oh yeah? Wow. Yeah, I don't, that's I don't what doubt they do. It. Yeah. They're, it's it's really a racket. I mean, yeah. so part of this, because I'm in the med mal world, you know, doctors are not required to carry insurance in Florida, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous um but the senators that that made this policy to not allow them they then mandated all auto mechanics carry three hundred thousand dollar minimum insurance to be an wow. auto mechanic wow. because they scratched the senator's mercedes uh -oh. <laughs> and he didn't like that they didn't have insurance uh -oh. so doctors do not need insurance but auto mechanics must have insurance because working wild. on a car is 
so much more valuable than working on a human being. Yeah. Wow. That's the kind of things that you deal with that we fight against. Yeah. And just, I mean, just recently to talk about House Bill 837 recently, they sure. keep talking about how rates are rising. We're in a crisis. We're not in a crisis. It's a nope. self-made crisis. Just lower what you guys are charging. They there don't is want no crisis. Lower. Yeah. So, you know, they made all these laws against MedMal. There's, you know, the, the pre-suit period, the lower statute of limitations. That was like in 2003, happen. Jeb Bush, 2003, right? Jeb okay. Bush. Yeah. And so it was to help carriers because the insurance was so expensive. Mm -hmm. Everything they wanted, they got because Jeb Bush, as we all know, you know, was a pushover and did whatever the insurance company told them. Low energy. <laughs> I mean, just <laughs> flaccid. He's a flaccid guy. <laughs> hey, so my kids went by this one day. <laughs> yeah, this flaccid guy. So he did whatever they wanted, he gave yeah. them everything they wanted, yeah. and all the rates continued to go up. Mm -hmm. So why do it? It didn't work. Right. There is no crisis. Doctors are not leaving. Florida's, what is Florida now? I think it's the second biggest state by population in the country. Yeah. It has grown. It's grown in every way, including doctors. Mm -hmm. But the insurance companies, because they control our governor. You know, the judges now, when I started doing PIP suits, every single Florida Supreme Court case came out in favor of the doctors, right? not the insurance company. So you could say liberal, conservative, whatever, but in that context, it's in favor of the doctors, not the insurance company. Um, in the last, like, uh, since 2018, whenever that was, um, every single Florida Supreme Court case for PIP has come out in favor of the insurance company. Sure. And it's, you know, it's like a pendulum swinging, you know? And it seems like it's swinging so far towards the insurance company now. It's outrageous. Uh, some of these cases that we have, you know, it's like, wait, are you guys for the doctor? Or are you for the billion dollar insurance, the local doctor or the billion dollar nope, insurance billion company? Dollar. So yeah. I, I've done articles on this. And if you ever want to really look to see just how disgusting it is, mm -hmm. there are things now, proposal for settlements. You ever use those? Yes. Yeah. to be called offer yeah. of judgment, yeah. proposal for settlement. Just look at the history of proposal for settlement in front of the district courts and Supreme Court. Every time a plaintiff wins and enforces a proposal for settlement attorney fee provision, mm -hmm. the courts have overturned it for some mm -hmm. defect. And every time the defendants win and enforce a proposal for settlement with defects, the defects are not consequential or, or not important. Mm -hmm. And so they've, all you gotta do is look at all of the record last 10 years of every proposal for settlement case in front of these appellate courts and Supreme Court, mm -hmm. and you'll see a very clear pattern mm -hmm. of what they're doing to help these insurance companies. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's an uphill battle to say the least. You know, they've got dozens of attorneys, they've got all the support staff, they've got everything paid. You know, they get paid every two weeks, every month, billable hours, and you know, guys like us, we work on contingency. We only get right. paid if we win. So we take the good cases for the most part, I would say 99% of the lawyers, they take the good cases. Correct. They don't file on cases that are nuisance and stuff like that. Real Correct. cases, real people hurt due to somebody else's negligence. And uh, we have an uphill battle because we're fighting an army of lawyers and insurance companies. And uh, you know our client's not sophisticated. Like, you know, they don't- And hundreds of millions of dollars in the system fighting against us. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of my clients, when I talk to them, because I have this smaller practice, where I'm very close with my clients and I believe in really helping people. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, so what, when we talk to our clients and we advise them what the laws are and where we are with things, they really understand and they wanna be part of the fight. And I think a lot of lawyers, and this drives me crazy with advertising lawyers, commercials. Or it has a little bit, but not that much. It makes me <laughs> nuts that they don't talk about the problems with the system to help educate the people. Yeah. Like we're the biggest, we're the best, we make the most money, we're aggressive. Okay, great. Meanwhile, tell the people what they're facing. So every mm -hmm. time I have a client and, and my staff's with me, they'll tell you, you know, if I reject the case, I go into a full litany explanation of why I have to reject the case. Mm. Of why in Florida, for instance, there's allowed a free kill. Doctors are allowed right. to kill anyone they want in med mal if they don't have children and they're not married. Mm -hmm. Then just kill them. No consequence. Right. They that's, love it. That's the controversial free kill, free uh, kill law that's going on. And there's been people trying to change that, but right. no movement. No one cares. My firm, uh, we've written a ton of articles. We've lobbied for it. We've tried to get it changed. Mm -hmm. People come to me all the time. You know, my 26-year-old son was killed. Clear malpractice, 100%. Mm -hmm. I can't help you. Yeah. But I educate. Here's why I can't help you. Here's the law why I can't help you. Here's the name of your congressman and your senator. Call them. Tell them you don't like that. They're allowed to just kill your child 
mm-hmm. without any consequences at all, because no one really investigates the doctors. ACA, which is the state-sponsored investigation of medical providers, has never once ever said a hospital did anything wrong. Mm. So there's no real consequence other than us trial lawyers. We're the only ones affecting change. Mm-hmm. Only we make the difference. You know, I talk about it a lot. We're like Smokey the Bear. Only we can prevent these tragedies from happening in the future. Yeah. And so I wish trial lawyers, when they advertise and when they talk to clients, really explained how important we are and how we're the ones that stop cars from exploding. Yeah. We stopped baby toys from having glass in it. Mm-hmm. We stopped asbestos from being everywhere. Mm-hmm. Trial lawyers, not the government, not some stupid organization, mm-hmm. trial lawyers. Right. And so we need to band together to say, we don't like what's happening in society. We don't like what they're doing to our clients. Let's make that difference. Yeah. And every advertising ought to have that. You also yeah. want to say the biggest, most aggressive, I won this, I won that, wonderful. Yeah. You also need to educate the public. And so that's a big part of my practice and what we do with the clients we take mm-hmm. and the clients we reject. Yeah, awesome. You know, it's we get a lot of calls from people. Hey, um, my other lawyer dropped my car accident case. I don't know why. Well, you take a look at it. And we look at it and it just turns out it's no bodily injury coverage, no UM coverage, no source of recovery. There's no money available. The person who hit him is driving a 20 year old Toyota Corolla. Right. They don't have money. We, right. we background check them. They don't have anything. So it's like, they don't take the time. Some of these bigger firms to just say, Hey, you don't have a case. Here's why I, I right. agree with you on that. And you know, I'm mostly in the auto context. You're obviously a med mal and, and some people just say, oh, we don't, we don't want it. And cause you know, it takes five more minutes to sit there and explain to them briefly yeah. what's going on. And, and uh, so that's incredible that you do that. Um, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, we were talking earlier about the FJA. They did a tremendous job this uh, past legislative session in uh, making a horrible situation not so horrible. It was still bad, but without them, the alternative would have been just complete zero recovery for right. anybody injured due to anybody's negligence. And that was right. that would have been a tragedy to the people of Florida. That happened to a, a Florida senator. Yes, it did. I don't remember the name of the person. And he became a huge advocate yeah. for plaintiff's rights once yeah. he realized, because he was a total low-life scumbag that wanted to take away all the rights. Yeah. And he realized, wow, I need help. Right. And now I'm in trouble. Yeah. We should make laws to let people who need help get help. Too late then. Too late then. Yeah. You know, yeah. you... You kind of thought Jeb Bush being so weak and flaccid, he'd want a little strength and help. Him we can talk about. Him we can talk about all day. I'm good. Um, You're good. You're talking about Jeb Bush. (laughs) And the mole, Um, Rick Scott. You ever seen like a mole that comes out of the ground? (laughs) Looks just like Rick Scott. Literally all pink and like wrinkling like, I'm out of the earth. What do I look like? That's what Rick Scott looks like. (laughs) Fucking mole. Oh man, that's funny. Um, So awesome. So uh, if, People, oh, let me ask you this question. What do you like to do for fun? You're not you're not destroying these uh, malpractice doctors. You're not working on legal matters. What do you like to do on your free time? So I'm a Miami kid, right? I love the beach. I love camping. Miami has some great areas to hang out and to ride. And, and things, something people may not know about me is I love to make briar pipes. I make like your grandpa would smoke, smoke an old briar wood pipe. Oh, okay. So I make those pipes and I sell them at a trade show once a year. And oh, cool. I love to okay. make these briar pipes. So you start with a like a piece of wood and you just start? I get a, it's called briar wood. It comes from the Mediterranean. Okay. So I have a supplier from Greece and a supplier from Italy and an Algerian guy. And wow. I get Algerian and Greek and Italian briar, depending on the color I want, so different variations. Okay. And then I shape them and carve them and wow. drill the holes and make stem pieces. A lot of my material comes out of Germany, actually, for the stems. Okay. And I put it together and I make these beautiful pipes. I also collect them, but I make these beautiful pipes and I sell them in Chicago at the International Chicago Pipe Show. That's once a year <laughs> where literally pipe makers from all over the world come. Oh, wow. Okay. They sell their pipes and trade pipes and collect pipes and tobacco. And we talk okay. about it and it's, so I have friends in Cyprus and Germany and Russia. Uh, those are my good friends. And then a bunch of American carvers. Okay. And we get together every year and 
eat, eat dish pizza and drink beer and oh, talk about man. pipes. I love, uh, uh, I think it's called Edwards or Eduardo's deep dish pizza out there in Chicago. That's like, that's what, that's the place. Illuminati's. That's Illuminati is the name of the Illuminati's place. Illuminati's okay. the place. Check that's it where out. you go. I love so deep we go, dish. we have a great time and you know, I, it's a, it's a wonderful community and I that's get to cool. make friends all over. And I was just in Copenhagen, um, over Christmas and saw a pipe carver friend of mine and oh, that's cool. went to a pipe shop in Denmark and hung out, smoked a pipe uh, in the winter and had a great time and talked. And that's cool. So I have friends all over the world from doing this. I, I got to say it. that's the most unique uh, thing I've ever heard anybody do on this podcast. That's pretty cool. You sure. get the award. <laughs> Kurzweilan pipes. There you go. I'll plug it. Yeah. Do you so have a website, website for it? Of course, I have a yeah, website talk, for my pipes. Website. Tell me the website. Tell me the website. com. Okay, cool. We'll get the link and we'll put it on the. Yeah, too, so, so it's cool. So it. I, I love doing it. So my office, you know, I have pipes in my office. and Okay. So I do a podcast as well with my office. Okay. Um, and I do a thing on TikTok, Stoic Sunday, because there's not enough Stoic philosophy in the world. If more okay. people understood philosophy, there'd be a better place for us to work what we do to help people. Mm -hmm. And so I read philosophy every Sunday to the world. Oh, wow. I smoke my pipe and I read philosophy. Okay. We'll get a good the link thing. to that podcast. What is a, is it, is it on a certain platform that we can link uh, it to? It's, yeah, it's on Spotify and Apple podcasts and it's called Serving Justice. Serving Justice. Okay, cool. We'll, we'll and I wrote a book, How Justice is Served. Okay. Um, which I don't know if you want to talk about, but during COVID, yeah. I'm a trial lawyer, a trial lawyer. So during COVID, I was shut down. You know, there was nothing I could do literally. And so because it's my office, my wife didn't want me home and threw me out and said, go to your office. I, said, I had the same thing. I have no work. I have nothing to do there. She's like, I don't care. Go to the office. And so after like a month of playing Angry Birds on my phone, wow. I thought I got to do something better than this. And so I wrote a book on how to be a trial lawyer because I think unfortunately with the current set of judges who hate trials, mm -hmm. I don't know why they're trial judges. And most lawyers, I think there's a real lack of mentoring mm -hmm. in trial law. Mm -hmm. And so with a lack of mentoring, there's just not a lot of new trial lawyers. And so I wrote a book of all of my experience and all my trials of 30 years. And and so it's called How Justice is Served and it's on Amazon. And oh, cool. it's a book on how to be a trial lawyer and how to communicate to juries. That's cool. And so that's what I did during COVID. Awesome. Uh, it's a funny story. My wife kicked me out of the house. Not, I got to remind everybody, not at night. I still slept at home right. at night, but during the daytime, she kicked me out of the house. She said, you can't be here. Uh, I was one of those dads who walked around the house with no shirt on. And I, next thing I know, I'm in the, the class on the iPad he's got. And I, and I had to like hit the floor, army crawl out of there. And my wife goes, you're done. So I would make it from Del Rey to our Doral office, 30 minutes flat. There was zero cars on the road. Right. It was beautiful. I would just go there. There's nobody on the road. Um, and uh, I was terrified of touching anything because I was like, I'm gonna die. My wife is sending me out here to die. <laughs> but it was because I'm so loud. I'm obnoxious on the phone. Yes. I have cut back significantly on the cursing. As my kids are getting older, they say the same things that I say. And I remember, I'll never forget my kid. He was like four or five. He goes, daddy, daddy, fa, fa, funny. And I was like, oh, thank God, dude. I was like, you have no idea right now. I was, I, cause his, my, my wife, his mom was in the car and I go, I'm a dead man if he finishes that word the way I think it's going. Um, but yeah, my wife kicked me out of the house too. She said, don't be here. She goes, I, she goes all you do is bullshit on the phone all day. And yeah. I go, that's my job. I got to <laughs> bullshit right. on the phone. So, um, so uh, yeah. like you, I'm, I'm a Miami kid. So I, you know, person <laughs> is just part of my vernacular. And, yeah. And so, but my wife is from Scotland. She's Scottish. Oh, and okay. They really curse. <laughs> so like, I'm like, wow, you can't say those words to my wife. And she's oh, like, uh, what the fuck are you talking about? And I'm like, relax. She the has the accent. She's, you know, she's been here 30 years oh, okay. now. So okay. it's kind of come down. Cause I imagine when she's it, angry, it comes out. When she's angry or drunk, it really comes <laughs> out. So I'm, expert at getting her angry and drunk because oh. I still love the accent. Yeah. So go. I don't care if she's yelling at me as long as she's yelling at me with her Scottish brogue. There you go. Jid, God damn it, Jid. <laughs> so I get that a lot when I get her mad. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, um, thank you for being on the podcast. It's been thank really you. cool. I really appreciate you coming up here. I had a great time. I learned a lot. Um, we're gonna plug you in any way we can. 
if uh, do we ever just look into that camera and tell everybody how they can get a hold of you, website, phone number, whatever sure. contact info you want, and mention where you handle cases, which you said is pretty much. Okay, well, yeah. I'm Jed Kurzban. Uh, my website is kktplaw.com, and you can get a hold of me at jed at kktplaw.com. Um, our phone number is 305-444-0060. I try cases all over the country, so I'm a bit of a fast-talking Miami kid, and so the first time I showed up in South Carolina with my local counsel, Chalmers Johnson, they said to me, Jed, you got to slow down your talk. I said, I think I'm talking slow. And they're like, you've said 400 words at the time I've said two. <laughs> and I said, that's because you talk really slow. Yeah. They're like, no. So, you know, uh, but I, I love juries. I talk to juries and I communicate with juries. I think that's where I'm special and my clients love me and I love my clients. So I purposely keep my firm small so that I can keep be with my clients. I, I don't want a hundred cases. I, mm -hmm. I wouldn't know a hundred clients. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that we have eight cases lets me really get in touch with them and be in touch with them. And, awesome. And that's how I get my cases from my clients. Awesome, awesome. And my local counsels I've worked with all over the country. Awesome. Well, thanks for being here. Really appreciate yep. you. Thank you, Take man. Time. It was great. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>